Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm the Workforce Development Officer for the NYA. Um, and what, you're, what you've logged on to is, um, I can't remember what number it is, but it's uh, the next in the series of uh, webinars as part of our Roots to Success programme. Um, is lottery funded kind of professional development for youth workers around the country. Um, so thank you all for coming. It's very, very good to see you. Uh, there isn't much housekeeping to do because obviously we're all at home. If you have a fire, just leave by your nearest exit. And uh, if you need the toilet, then, you know, no one's going to stop you. Um, so I'll hand over to the we are oh, right. The one thing that I do need to mention is uh, we will be recording this session and that's so that people can access it at a later date. So it will be going up on our website. Um, so if you if you don't want to be recorded, then keep your camera off. Um, if you want to put your camera on and don't want to be shown on screen, then if you let me know in the chat, then that'll be fine. Um, but otherwise, we'll be putting up with a few edits just to get rid of dead air uh, so that people can log into it at a later date. Um, so that's enough from me. I'll hand over to LJ and Alicia, who've come to run the webinar from Youth Employment UK. Uh, and I'll shut up and leave them to it. Thank you, Kev. But feel free to chime in. I, I don't mind your dulcet tones at all. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, it is great to be here. We are um, really looking forward to sort of sharing some of our knowledge and experience about the youth employment landscape, particularly um, the rocky elements that we've seen over the last um, 10 months now. So um, I'm joined by my colleague, Alicia Patel. Um, I think I think it's fair to say, you know, we want to make this um, session fairly interactive. So um, please do use the chat function or raise your hand. We'll all be keeping an eye out for that if you want to stop at any point and just have a clarification of an issue. Um, we are making the um, we have made the presentation interactive. You will need a pen and paper around with you. So um, why I just go into sharing screen mode, if you can just make sure that you've got access to that before we get started, it will save us a little time as we get underway. So I'm just going to share my screen. And away we can go. Right, so the main focus of this is um, on, on supporting young people on their journey to work. As I've said, we're going to touch on sort of the difficult elements that we've seen over the last 10 months, but hopefully and very practically towards the end of this session, give you some really useful, free to access resources um, that we've co-created with young people um, that will support you in the work and the outreach that you're doing, either individually or kind of across your organisation. Um, as, as we said, as Kev said, there's not a big housekeeping issue, but if I can um, ask you to remain muted until, unless you've got a question or until we get to those interactive sessions, that'll be great. I'm really easily distracted. I also need to um, apologise in advance. I've got um, two children at home, homeschooling. I've gone onto my um, uh, phone Wi-Fi internet just to ease with the broadband issues, but let me know if you're, you're struggling. Um, but that might mean the children pop in at some point, hopefully with coffee and there's two dogs here so I apologize in advance for any disturbance um, I can't wait for the day that I can stop saying that at the start of any presentation I deliver um, if you're struggling with bandwidth you might want to turn your camera off to try that so as I've said I am the CEO of Youth Employment UK and actually the founder of Youth Employment UK and, and founded the organization back in 2011 when we had the last youth unemployment crisis. So those of you that have been working in and around young people for a long period of time you'll, you'll remember after the um, recession of 2008 we saw youth unemployment peak to 1 million young people meet um, not in education, employment or training. And it was a time where I really felt, um, having worked at the periphery of the youth employment sector, that something something else needed to come in and change and, uh, you know, to, to help the system change that was needed around our young people. So um, that, that's me. I'm, I'm, as I've said, parent, um, CEO and wear many, many other hats. Um, and I'm joined today by Alicia Patel, who is our Youth Engagement and Plastic Coordinator. Do you want to so hi Alish. Yes, so hi uh, yeah, my name's Alicia. As Aljay has already introduced me, I used to be a youth worker and now I work with Aljay at Youth Employment UK. So my job is to look after our ambassadors and run the ambassador programmes and we give um, 
young people have voiced here at Youth in Front UK, so that's my role. Thank you. Great stuff. Thanks, Alicia. Um, so just whistle stop of what we're going to run through. We're going to, um, you know, just follow up with those introductions, give you a bit more detail about us um, and then get into what young people tell us about their experiences around youth employment. Um, we're going to touch on the impact of COVID to that. And then we've got some videos from some of our ambassadors that Alicia works with. Um, so we can hear it directly from those young people in our networks of what they're really feeling and experiencing during um, COVID. Uh, we've got time for a break. So, you know, of course, feel free if you need to jump off beforehand, but there is time and schedule for a break before we then go into the, the solution driven element of this session. Uh, I should add um, that MYA have, have these slides handy and I'm sure they'll be sharing them. What we've tried to do where possible is include live links. So when you get the slides, you'll be able to go direct to the pages that we're referring to. Um, so that, that will hopefully save you a bit of time post the event too. So just very briefly, who are Youth Employment UK? Well, over the last um, 10 years, we've become experts in youth employment. Uh, we are a not-for-profit social enterprise, and ultimately our role here is to help tackle youth unemployment. And we do that in a couple of ways, as you'll see in our core aims. But I think the, the most unique thing about us is, is our youth voice, is that we are youth-led. We don't do from the top to young people. We don't assume we know what they're experiencing and what they want and what they need from services or from policy we work with our young people very interactively consistently across our organization and then build from that with our young people those solutions those policy positions so when we're working with government and, and we do have very good relationships across dwp and dfe um, we are often there taking young people with us directly to sit down with ministers or sit senior civil servants to share and explore what's happening and, and what needs to be done so that youth-led element um, threads throughout everything that we do. And, and as you'll see through this presentation, and we're going to share with you the, the views of our young people within our network, but also as we get into some of those solutions, they have been co-designed by young people because of that being you know, core to who we are. So giving young people a voice on the youth employment issues that affect them, our only focus is youth employment, so that makes us quite unique there too in that sort of very driven, very um, focused um, issue area. Uh, we support those young people then on their journey to employment. So we understand what their barriers and challenges are by listening and talking and working with them. And then with them, we've created some of those um, skills and career support that they tell us that they often lack as they transition between education and employment. We also then work with employers. Um, one of the big you know, things that young people often tell us is that employers put up unnecessary barriers to their entry into the world of work. So requiring work experience when we know many schools aren't consistently offering work experience or uh, requiring 10 GCSEs for entry level roles when we know that only um, 50% of our young people will pass GCSEs first time round. So it's, it's that kind of disconnect between young people and employers that we try and address through um, working with employers directly. We're home to what's called the Youth Friendly Employer Badge. So any employer that works with us has to um, subscribe to the principles of good youth employment um, and, and agree to remove some of those barriers. So we, when we do talk about employers and when we are promoting certain employers, it's on the basis that they have um, made that step change in kind of being youth friendly. Then, as um, kind of our fourth and final element of the work that we do, is work with government to implement what we're hearing from young people with young people um, across the different policy areas. We are the secretariat to the all party parliamentary group for youth employment, um, which has young people in the lead of, and we do a lot of consultation across government, as I said, but also in creating submissions to different policy and um, inquiries too. So that's who we are without further ado. Um, what we're going to get into in this first instance is um, Youth Employment UK um, produce a piece of work every year called the Youth Voice Census. This is a large survey that um, is now in its, will be in its fourth year this year that we send out to the young people in our network. Um, our network are 14 to 24 year olds. So we provide services and insight at that cohort specifically, 14 to 24. Um, send the questionnaire, the survey out to our network and our, through our partners. Um, it typically has over 100 questions. And what we're trying to do is really understand from young people directly at that 
what their particular barriers and challenges are, what they're experiencing on the ground. It's a temperature check. What do they feel about different um, things that, that, they're, that they're going through, whether that's education, at college, at university level, um, if they've been unemployed, how they experience that, how do they feel about where they live? Um, the, the, so the census is a massive piece of work and a massive undertaking. But it gives us a really strong indication of how young people feel. Now, um, up until this year, it's not been statistically representative. We don't weight it based on um, the number of uh, young people across different categories. What we are looking at doing it with it this year is doing more of that work so that we will have a statistically representative report in 2021. She says, all being well. Uh, but up until now, it's, it is representative of our network as opposed to of all young people. Um, what we're going to go through now is the results of the 2020, the headlines, uh, not the big detail, but I really would welcome you to, to visit the Youth Voice Census on our website and you can see the past three um, reports that are there and watch videos from young people kind of talking about the, the reports and their experience of this. It provides a really good um, understanding, you know, across a broad range of issues for all of us working with young people. Uh, so uh, we're going to go through the 2020 some of that um, key findings and get your pens and paper ready because we're going to we're going to test what you know or you assume the answers will be based on the questions we've asked our young people. Um, so the first area that we looked at um, with the Youth Voice Census is careers information, really, and um, identified that there has been a, a real information inequality. The level of careers information you get at school and college. Alicia, can I just get you to monitor the chat function? Um, I'm just saying... Oh, oh, is you putting something into the chat function? That's fine, but um, I can't read the chat function, hold the screen and present all at the same time, um, despite what my staff team think about me. So got it. Not, excellent. If you can answer anybody's questions, if they're struggling with this, that'd be great. So what we have found is that depending on your age, your race, your gender, your eligibility for free school meals will depend on what careers guidance and information you're receiving. Blows my mind that in 2020, it can really come down to some of those rudimentary, rudimental uh, characteristics as to how we support young people into their next steps. So what we want you to do is to tell us if we've articulated um, accurately if um, these inequalities play out so that if um, do you think it's true and if you're unsure or false and you can use the chat function to give us your answer to this question so type one two or three in the chat function it will test to make sure you're all on the same page with us if you think these statements are, would be true that young women are sold the vacational route and young men are sold the academic one that those young people with additional needs are likely to hear about all of the options available to them. And we're talking about careers education in the sense of um, going to college, going to university, apprenticeships, traineeships, internships, et cetera. Um, and the third statement is that students who had received free school meals are less likely to be told about job centres. So what do you think? Are we true, unsure or false about those three statements? How do you think that would actually play out? We've got mostly th oh we've got all threes we've got a two we're getting threes all round really here okay um great stuff we could have sent us three yeah then these guys know what they're doing alicia we probably we probably don't even need to be here um <laughs> It, it's you're you're correct they're false actually young men are being sold the vocational route still in 2020 and um, young women were sold the academic route so we found through the survey and this this applies to lots of different stages of education so from being in secondary school it's the same whether you're in college and it's the same if you're at university if you're a young man you will be recommended and, and consistently spoken to about the vocational routes more often than young women where young women are being told about those academic routes so there's some real gender stereotyping that still exists around that careers education space and for young people themselves in, in how they um, you know, define their um, aspirations and how they think about um, roles and, and gender. Those with additional needs are much less likely to hear about all the options for them, so they're less likely to be told about university, they're less likely to be told about things like um, college pathways or apprenticeships um, than any, anybody without additional needs. 
Um, and those young people on free school meals are almost the only cohort that hear about job centre. Now, if you consider that we are in a, trend, in a period where we're going to have a million neat young people again, the data hasn't quite caught up, but the expert group um, where we then expect the youth unemployment data now to be a million um, young people neat. That won't just apply to young people who were free school meals or those with additional needs. All of our young people will be experiencing periods of unemployment here. And they will have needed to know how to access the job centre. Um, we're going to get into the detail of this in, in, in the second half of the session. But the government's plan for jobs and its announcement of the programme Kickstart, which is a um, paid work experience programme, is only available to those young people who are on universal credit, who have gone and got help from the job centre. So actually for young people not to hear and not to understand the services that are available to them if they become unemployed is a real challenge because it means things like um, Kickstart, which is a great programme, isn't going to be available to them. So it just shows that you know we have to get this information out to young people in a really fair and um, unbiased way so that all young people know about all of their routes and we're not stifling um, opportunity and we're not limiting young people to support either. Um, so the next, the next one, and this is going to, we're going to give you a minute just to write down as many um, answers as you can. Alicia, can you can you time this and, and we'll tell them when to go and tell them when to stop if that's okay. Um, so the barriers to employment, we asked young people, those that were neat, uh, what some of the biggest barriers were to them that they think they face in accessing employment. So what do you think uh, young people told us that, that the barriers are for them? Um, if you want to take a minute and I say go, Anisha, if you can hold us accountable, let's see, let's see what we come up with in that minute. I'm ready. I'm ready with my stopwatch. Are we going? Yep. Okay, go. We've actually got some being put in the chat function. So we've got transport, location, quells. I don't know what quells are. I'm not sure what that is. Well, it's qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> Opportunities, mental health, cost of transportation. Lack of confidence. I think some of our colleagues have read the census. <laughs> Got about 10 seconds left on the clock. Right, three, two, one. Thank you. So, um, quite right in some of those um, issues that you've raised in the chat function. Um, work experience is one of the top issues for young people. I don't know that I saw that, but it is it is something that comes up time and time again. And and you know, it's that catch twenty two. You can't get work experience without work experience. This is a real problem in um, light of COVID because more employers are have, have suspended work experience programs. And also when we talk about work experience in this sense, it's not just you know that two week school placement, it is also having a part-time job alongside your education. You know, the, the young people are more likely to be working in you know in those areas in hospitality, in retail, in leisure and tourism. So were the first furloughed out or the first to have their opportunities kind of shut down. So work experience is a top issue for young people that they perceive and is um, certainly going to only be amplified pretty much like the rest of these because of COVID. So anxiety, that mental health really came through. Uh, the opportunity, lack of just you know living in an area where there just aren't good jobs. Um, you know we, we talk about that, don't we? And when we're thinking about the leveling up agenda, there are so many parts of our country uh, where they just aren't the same level of opportunity. And I live in um, Northamptonshire. We're based in Kettering. But I live in a town called Corby, which has has um, you know it's an old steel town. Uh, and some of our young people have never seen outside of Corby as a town. 
to be. I know what opportunities lie for them beyond, you know, beyond uh, um, boundary boundary lines. Um, so if there's no opportunities here, they don't have that confidence and knowledge of what else exists. So so that opportunity issue, depending on where you live, is a real is a real challenge. Young people don't necessarily believe they've got the right skills for the jobs that are available or, or how to apply that. You know, um, that's a real issue sometimes in just their confidence in articulating their skills. And the amount of CV workshops I've done in schools and with young people where you say, so what skills do you have? And they just can't articulate that. So it doesn't mean that they don't have skills. You have to just eke it out. They need a trusted adult to help them do that. Travel and location and then wider mental health issues come in. One of the things that really struck me this year and, and the census ran from February, um, so at the beginning of, you know, pre-lockdown in February to the middle of um, March, so no, actually to the end of March, um, we had to extend it because of lockdown. Um, and what came up in there too, and things like discrimination, young people believing that their race, and this was before the Black Lives Matter campaign really kind of um you know kicked off young people believe that their race would hold them back too so um social status you know the the poverty lines are holding them back um social economic status there and disability so um really concerning issues in terms of what young people are seeing you know um happening to them and to their peers that made them answer this question in this way so moving on from there we wanted to um find out what we think um, young people would benefit from, how they think we could improve their education careers, you know, their careers education, what's happening to them. So again, we just want you to take 30 seconds. I'm really happy for you to use the chat function. It means we can kind of share ideas and, and see what you guys think, or you can do it privately and just jot down 30 seconds of what you think young people told us um, government could do to improve uh, their education and careers. And Lisa, you're on the timer. So we've got in the chat function, um, interview techniques, more work experience, um, how to apply or find jobs, knowing what opportunities are actually available. And that is 30 seconds. Sorry, I didn't give you more morning. That's all right, that's all right. We'll, we'll be good at this by the end of it. Yeah, the, the, those, those suggestions are key, but the thing that comes out time and time and time again when we talk to young people is about having quality, personalised one-to-one support. There's a lot of careers education policy right now that, that says, you know, it, it's okay if a school has, you know, a, an expert speaker come from the world of work and deliver an assembly. And that that is, that is good. It, it does enrich that experience. But it's how that that translates into what does that mean for me? If a engineer goes into a school, a male engineer goes into a school, a white male engineer goes into a school, a white old male engineer goes into a school to talk about careers in engineering, there are a lot of people in the audience um, who won't relate back to that speaker, who won't apply what they're learning or hearing to themselves because they cannot see themselves in that career um, and it amplifies the stereotype so some of that that really good at stuff that happens around the edges shouldn't be done in isolation it really does need for for somebody an expert and not necessarily a qualified to level 10 careers expert but somebody who really can understand get to know and understand that young person and personalize the information that they're hearing into that context into what it means for that young person to sit down and spend some time with them to help them think and navigate through their next step options um, and that's whether you're in education or actually if you're you're spending time as a young unemployed person it's about having someone that you can trust that can help you build confidence in your skills and help you plan your next steps you know um, and it goes for lots of us that we will benefit from mentoring and coaching and that's what's missing in the system for lots of young people and it's where I get really excited by the youth work sector because I think it is a huge skill set that the youth work sector bring to young people um, and can help bring out those um, really really strong um, 
questions and looking at looking at skills and looking at building confidence in a different way. Um, so getting that personalised one to one support is really, really important. So we asked young people about the work experience placements because as we heard they're really important as um, young people transition. It's the place where, you know, even if you have a rubbish work experience, I don't know about you, but you can tell us in your chat box if you had work experience and if it was good or rubbish, where, where was it? Mine was in a council office in the HR department and I spent two weeks um, filing HR personnel records of the last 20 years doing archives. Some of it I hated, but when I was given the opportunity to go into the chamber and sit in and listen to a council meeting or do some, some of the other stuff that came with that, I really loved. So what I learned was I wasn't going to do filing for a living, but I, but I also got <laughs> some really good experience. Plus that, you know, set change in not being in school and having to think slightly differently in, in the world of work. Um, Alicia, where did you, did you get work experience when, where you were? I did, yes. Yeah. So I actually went to an office and did an admin role with my auntie and I realised that it wasn't something that I wanted to do at the time and I wanted to work with people and be out and be doing things. So it was valuable because it made me realise what I didn't want to do. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was work experience. Good. And what about in the chat function? Has anyone done anything really, really noteworthy that makes you jealous? Um, some people have said they have no option for experience in their schools, actually. Somebody had, was peeling potatoes and she knew that she didn't want to work in catering. <laughs> <laughs> do you do the cooking in your house now or do you still refuse to peel a potato? I wonder. But, but they get, you know, it's a really rich experience, whatever it is. If nothing else, it makes for a great dinner party story at, um, later on in life. But this is what young people were telling us. So of those um, in education, 66% were offered work experience, which actually in 2020 was an increase on the previous year's data. So we had seen that go up because schools are doing more on the topic of careers education. Government invested in the careers and enterprise company and um, you know, there's a lot of policy going into schools, a lot more support going into schools. So we were really pleased last year to see that increase. But of course, what we know now is that that, that will come back down this year. If we were to ask the same question, almost no, no cohort would, would get work experience in 2020, you know, from, from March 2020 through to the end of the year. So 82% um, of young people took the work experience they were offered um, and, and pretty much, you know, they rated that as a good or excellent experience. So it just shows, you know, not all young people are getting it, but when they do get it, it rates high. What we want you to do is also tell us what you think young people told us that the benefit was of that work experience. We've perhaps talked about a couple in, in the discussion so far, but what else do you think young people kind of identified they benefited from during their work experience? Alicia, you're on the timer this time. I'm starting the time, so go. So the chat function is going off and we have um, improved confidence, getting out of school <laughs> with an explanation mark, um, <laughs> developing new skills, communication skills and problem solving skills, um, a better idea of their career path. Practical life of work, um, meeting new people and improved confidence in social skills, working alongside people of different ages and experiences. We've got about five seconds left on the clock and just being treated differently to, to school, being treated as an adult. Oh, our time's up. <laughs> There we go. It really is. Thank you. Okay. 
so you can just see here you're you're absolutely right it's the skill building it's helping to make decisions about future what it feels like to be at work the experience that you're going to need to get get to the next step and also quite a few young people understood it built their network their personal sort of contacts so um really valuable stuff um, where do young people go for help? So this is the next question. So, you know, we want you to, you know, short, short um, question here. Who do you think is the first person in a young person's mind about, uh, I need help in my career planning, my decision making, my next steps? Where are they going? If we can start the timer, Alicia, for 30 seconds, let's see what um, your instincts tell you. Okay, 30 seconds on the clock. So we've got parents, youth workers, teachers, family, friends, career advisors, wider network of family, anyone they think they can trust and who will listen. Okay, we've got about five seconds left on the clock. And last one is social media. Okay, super. Thanks, Leish. Okay, so and this is this is what we hear. So the the greatest um, volume of young people go to a parent or carer first and have that conversation. Um, the next will be um, school and um, relatives and friends do fit in there, but also a lot of. Um, Young people have to go out there and find the information and find the opportunities for themselves too. And that's really important that they then have the skills to be able to do that. Um, so, so that just kind of shows you that split. Um, young people were keen to point out that doing poor quality placements not linked to their interest did not feel valuable to them. So there was something, something else within this work experience section in that, you know, where we talk about the value of even doing poor work experience, young people young people today um, find that quite frustrating. They want to be doing the things that really stoke their interest. They don't probably want to go and peel potatoes or work in a nursery if they've got no ambition to work in education. And I think for some young people, they're finding that they're kind of just being shoved into places sometimes rather than getting the opportunity to do some of the bigger, bigger more interesting things linked to their future careers. Um, so we asked young people, we're moving on to what choices are being offered. So we've kind of covered that careers and, and work experience element. And so we wanted to sense what choices young people were being offered and discussed with them whilst they were in secondary school, um, as well as what careers and employability information they were receiving. So we're going to give you 30 seconds just to note down what options that you know are currently available to young people post-secondary school. So post GCSEs, really, I guess this is because we're using an example there of A-levels. So what Routes and options do you think there are for young people now um, when they finish their GCSEs? 30 seconds. 30 seconds on the clock. So we've got apprenticeships, college, university, sixth form, repeated, um, the same, uh, gap year, BTEX. So we've had a couple of the same ones. Mm -hmm. And five seconds on the clock. And the last one is staying in education. Okay, so we'll have a look at them. Did anybody say T levels? Nobody said T levels. Uh... No, which which doesn't surprise me, but they they are the new qualification that is um, being made available to young people, and that, and we'll get into the detail of some of that stuff a bit later. But it just shows how much you have to stay ahead of what's going on to be able to identify all of those different pathways and what is most suitable to young people based on their needs, their individual kind of ambitions and skills, and and where they are in their life, and 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 not just themselves personally but their families too because that can have a real bearing on on certain groups of young people about they might have caring needs or there might be financial responsibility associated with them staying staying in certain um, forms of education training
Of course, all young people um, should be in some form of educational training and, um, you know, up until they're 18. And that is a legal requirement. I have found I've got a 16 year old who finished his GCSEs last summer. Well, no GCSEs, but was that year group that he now has um, peers from his school who are no longer in any form of education or training, um, who have managed to, to find employers who will just give them a job without formal training um, at 16. So, so, you know, this is being necessarily monitored, but it is a legal requirement. Just to, just to add. But there are these routes, traineeships, apprenticeships, thinking about university, starting a business, you know, it's something that quite a lot of young people are really thinking about. It's a real, it's a real game changer for some young people who want to work in the creative sector, freelancing or being self-employed in some way or starting a business. Um, going on to sixth formal college, you might do your T levels at a sixth formal college, um, but also making sure that that information about job centre access is there. There are three topics that were never discussed amongst a high percentage of the respondents. So, so respondents, um, a high percentage, would never have had traineeships starting a business or accessing a job centre discussed with them, which are, as I've said right up from the onset, when you then go into a youth unemployment crisis, probably the three pathways that you need to, to have open and available to you. Um, but none of us have crystal ball for COVID. I do get that. So we wanted to understand about employability skills for young people and we asked them if they're aware of what skills employers are looking for and how confident they felt about these skills. Um, using the skill builder essential eight essential skills so um, there is a framework that's been created by an organization called skill builder um, who have identified eight essential skills um, what do you think um, young people told us they think employers are looking for sorry my, my trip of my time that probably didn't make the most sense but you've got 30 seconds to jot down the skills that you believe employers are looking for what you think young people told us so um let's go on this one okay the time are we starting now so in the chat we've got flexibility um good timekeeping being organized having confidence Time management, a good work ethic, um, team working, reliability, problem solving. Got about five seconds left on the clock. And last one is efficient. Good stuff. Okay, and you know this is this is where I, I guess this is so familiar territory, such familiar territory to you know you guys in youth work. So um, these are the these are the eight skill builder skills, and they talk about so aiming high, being motivated, um, and and driven, creativity, leadership, listening, presenting, problem solving, staying positive, and teamwork. So this is a framework that now many employers are looking at and using, being recommended to by um, different um, bodies uh, but for young people some of these skills aren't skills that they're necessarily hearing about or that they understand how to develop um, and how to kind of um, progress or, or even just articulate that they have these skills in different areas and we'll come back to how what the solutions are to some of that in the second half of today's session so we wanted to know um, how, when young people are moving into work, where they could look for work and if they've ever applied for jobs. We wanted to know if they had a CV, if they have, have um, had experience of an interview. So you can see, um, you know, quite a lot of the young people in our census um, reach have, have started that transition or already transitioned into employment and, and had, had these things available to them. What we ask them and what we want to kind of ask you is where a young person can start looking for work. You know, in one of your questions, somebody in one of your responses, somebody said, you know, young people need help in understanding where to look for work. So we want to um, find out from you what where you think a young person can start. So go now, Alicia. Yep, time is starting on the clock. So um, in our chat function, we've got social media, the internet, online, Indeed, CV dropping shops and businesses, um, family and friends, 
newspaper, job centre. We've got about five seconds left on the clock. So the last one is youth groups and newsletters. Okay. So we're moving on. This, so the answers are rather, we're not moving on. I, um, the answers are, in looking at employers' own website, young people find that really useful resource to, to you know, work out about the next steps, what, what's there, what's available to them. Um, they do find job boards pretty useful too, and personal networks. Personal networks is a real contentious issue for me because there are so many young people who um, have parents that um, don't have those networks and so it creates that inequality if you if you come you know think about my own children I'm so very well connected to the world of work and so my children will, will you know naturally get um you know was open to them and opportunities open to them that their own friendship group wouldn't have access to simply because of the job that I have um, so that is a real inequality around social mobility that 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 I, I get really frustrated by we've got to do more about opening up networks to young people regardless of their social economic status social media came in there um, and sites like find an apprenticeship which is the government's own site is also up in the top places of, of, of where to go to find um, work and opportunities so you'll, you'll see we're, we're at the end of kind of this, this section and then looking and, and trying to understand what young people are experiencing. As I said, you know, the survey was live pre-COVID and um, most of our respondents came pre-COVID because once COVID hit, young people weren't really thinking about getting on and completing our youth voice census with its hundred bloody questions. And um, that we know to be true. So, so this was really when the world was okay in their in their book, you know, in, in terms of you know, <laughs> there was no pandemics, there was no Black Lives Matter um, campaigns challenge, challenging their views and experiences, and then all of that struck. And so, since then, we've really seen what impacts COVID has had on young people and and their experiences, which I just want to touch on before we go into the break, and and then we'll come back on a more positive note. COVID-19 comes with just more than a health warning. It has um, dramatically impacted the life experiences and life chances of our young people. Um, for those young people who, like my son and his peers who, were, who should have been doing their GCSEs or A-levels or graduating from university, they had all of that pulled out from underneath them without notice or warning. Um, young people, as I've said already, are more likely to work in the sectors that went into immediate furlough and lockdown. And because young people are more often to be working on precarious contracts, zero hours, low pay, there was no provision in that to, to be protected um, when it came to who was being furloughed. It was a last in, first out situation for lots and lots of businesses. So young people there um, found themselves for the first time, you know, unemployed in a labour market that wasn't positive for, for their skills. Um, so we had we had this this um, perfect storm, if you like, with young people who were leaving education for the first time entering a labour market that was turbulent. Young people who were in the early parts of their careers being uh, made redundant or being let go, joining those um, graduates and school leavers alongside the fact that we still had quite high level of youth unemployment before COVID. Young people were still three times more likely to be unemployed than any other group. So you've got this swell of things happening in that um, youth employment ecosystem that really just went against all young people who were looking for work. And I think the other thing that we really have seen, and we're, we're all seeing it in the press, even, even as recently as yesterday, is the social inequalities have been increased. Again, you know, my, my children, uh, you know, in a privileged position, they're in a house full of broadband and internet, they've got support to access school, uh, but there are too many young people living in digital poverty, too many young people with parents unable to, whether because they're working, they just don't have the skills to be able to support the education transition. Or, or rather the education needs and we know that lots and lots of young people who are living 
in poverty or living in difficult circumstances have really um, you know, seen, seen those circumstances amplified. The number of calls to Childline during lockdown um, doubled overnight, literally. So, so there is a lot happening in that space to young people that just isn't good. And, and of course, you know, the sectors that support our young people, the charity, third sector, the youth sector, are all, are all facing um, different challenges there too. Um, so unemployment is at a record high now because of COVID and there are more young people not in education, employment or training than there have been in the last um, eight years. Um, because as I've said, those sectors, um, and it's going to be challenging for some time. The financial recession was in 2008, but it took until 2011 for the peak to really so it could well take another two or three years before we see the real Im implication of COVID. Alicia, I think I might need you to mute yourself. Um, so it took two to three years before we really saw that implication. And interestingly, though we don't have a study about the long-term mental health um, challenges of a pandemic, we have got studies that we can relate to in terms of other... Um, so in Australia when they had the really big bushfires and young people got displaced from education and where they live um, the mental health impacts of that almost were attributed to conditions such as um, PTSD um, that young people were really living living um, very difficult lives because of those early experiences of, of displacement so we don't know yet how bad this is going to be in terms of young people and their mental health and their transition points and uh, all of those things that were discussed. So there's some real issues that we can't see yet, but we certainly know and can expect that youth unemployment is going to continue to rise at least over this next 12 months. Um, so not, not a great place for us all to be working, but there is some really good stuff that we're going to get into in this next session about what can be done. How can we help? I think the sectors have become really innovative in the, in the last 12 months about how we work with young people and where the gaps are. Um, we're certainly working better together. You know, as a CEO of a third sector organisation, I can say that, you know, fellow CEOs have been really, you know, working around the clock to try and make sure that we're meeting needs and demands in different ways. So there is some really really good innovative stuff coming and and the more we know about the problem the better we prepared we all are to support it so we're going to get into some good stuff shortly um, we're going to take a break Alicia how long did we um allocate for a break right now I think it was 10 minutes but I think we should stick to five if that's okay Okay, so let's take a five minute break and then we will come back and look into some more detail about um, the solutions. Thank you all so much. And if you've got questions and you're not taking a break, chuck them in the chat box and we'll take some time to have a look at them while, while the rest of you are gathering coffee. Hopefully everyone's back with us. Um, I know some of you will need to go throughout this next se session. It's, it's, it is a long session. It's, it's a complicated topic that has been, you know, complicated for a long time. So unpicking some of these things is, is not easy and a quick fix. Um, we are going to get into the solution bit. So I would recommend if you do have to leave, you know, picking up the recording from MYA afterwards or reaching out to Alicia and I um, so that we can share some, some further resources with you if that's helpful. And um, we'll be delivering on the Youth Voice Census again. My colleagues and my team are just working out what the Youth Voice Census will look like in 2021 because, of course, it has to be a little different comparing... Um, apples and pears as we would be if we were trying to ask the same questions this year as we did last so um we, you know we'll be very grateful for your networks and helping us reach as many young people so that we can temperature check um the various areas we'll be looking at in the 2021 census will be great but what i wanted to see what i had admitted and i'm uh, particularly apologetic for that, is what Alicia's hearing from our ambassadors. You know, it's really important. The census, as I say, was delivered before COVID. I've talked about the impact of COVID in terms of labour market, but Alicia's going to just share with us a little bit of the ambassador kind of feedback she gets. So, Alicia, we'll hand this over to you. Okay, I'd just like to point out that I have put my email address in the chat function if anybody wants to get in contact. Um, so, when COVID hit last year, and with like in our third lockdown, I believe, one of the things that we realized is that we needed to support our ambassadors and the young people that we work with. So how we did that was we set up um, 
weekly sessions on a Tuesday. We called them wellbeing sessions. So this was a safe space for our young people to come where they could kind of just unload and work through some of their headspace and talk about their mental health and not only just get to know me as the new ambassador, but each other. And I think one of the things that came out of that was they realised they weren't alone in how they were feeling. So our ambassadors have an range of different experiences and backgrounds. So whether that's they're 14 or 16, whether they're in full-time education, they're working, they're looking for work, they're in apprenticeships, um, they're from different ethnic backgrounds. But one of the things that was kind of clear was that all of the young people were affected by COVID. And I would like um, LJ to go to the next slide where you can hear directly from our ambassadors. This just might take a minute and how we follow through. Not a minute, but it's opening the video on another element of my computer. The main impacts of COVID-19 on me as a university student and a part-time worker is just the uncertainty of it. You don't know week to week whether university is going to be online next year or face to face and part time jobs. You don't know if it's secure. Um, so I think something that would really help is just strong leadership and forward thinking. So that was Karis. This is Seda. Seda's quite quiet, but we have um, copied in her script, so you'll be able to see that if you struggle to hear Seda. Hi, I'm Seda, and COVID-19 negatively affected me, as when the lockdown was announced, I was in year 11, so Schools were shut down, my GCSEs were cancelled, my work experiences postponed or cancelled and I was abruptly put on for online learning which I found very difficult to cope with because I didn't have my teachers helping me. It was a lot harder to find resources, a lot harder to find information regarding my exams and it was a very uncertain time as we weren't given much information. I'd just like to point out that Saida is actually our youngest ambassador. She's 16. They're amazing. She's a joy. Sorry for the delay, guys. COVID has challenged me in many ways. All the face of many challenges, as a pandemic, as another. I struggled to find work because of lack of opportunities and no disability conscious jobs. I struggle with the chain of uncertainty, trying to bring because of my spurges. I get down a lot e very easily, but with no, with no job and not to my boyfriend because of lockdown. It makes me down a lot more. Having a phone is hard, as a pandemic. I'm not support, miss my life, hell. So Ella is um, an amazing ambassador for us who has been speaking at a lot of events and with a minister during lockdown too. She met with the minister for um, apprenticeships to talk about her, her own struggle in finding work and finding disability conscious um, employers. Um, this is hardly the last of these videos. Hi, I'm Harvey, an ambassador for Youth Employment UK. Coronavirus um, has impacted me greatly, especially at the start of the first lockdown. I, I'm self-employed and I lost quite a lot of work initially 
thankfully that I did pick up and I was busy again throughout um, lockdown but I also had another part-time position um, which I was made redundant from last summer that was in the hospitality sector. I think that one of the biggest challenges I've had as well is adjusting to working from home all the time and um, trying to work and relax in the same space has been a huge challenge. So um, thanks to Alicia for organising for the ambassador videos. And, and as you hear there, lots of different challenges, you know, from, from the graduates to the, to the school um, students, to those self-employed, to those unemployed, which really echoes, I think, and highlights the, the different impact COVID will have on all of us, in, regardless of our circumstances. And there's a break. That's what I missed. Uh, we're back on track now and I just wanted to very briefly kind of you know come back to the fact that there are lots of opportunities av available you know government really are hearing the organizations like like Youth Employment UK and our partners who are lobbying um, they're very hard to ensure that there is an opportunity for every young person so last summer Rishi Sunak announced the plan for jobs which involved programs like Kickstart and, and I've talked about that a little bit but it's a paid work experience opportunity that is being offered to those young people who are on Universal Credit. If you're on Universal Credit too you'll be able to access sector-based work academies, you'll be able to access the funding that's gone into extra work coaches and youth hubs. Um, youth hubs are a really big initiative coming out of the Department for Work and Pensions. Um, I'm really happy to go into all of these pathways and opportunities in more detail, but I would um, you'd certainly be able to say to you, when, when we won't do the exercise at the bottom, but certainly be able to say that there is a pathway and should be a pathway for all of our young people. The information available to these about who's entitled to them, the benefits of them, um, what, what qualifications or experience you need to access them is available through the government site. But um, we've, we've done a little bit better than that in producing this information for young people on our own website. And I'm going to walk through some of that now. Um, so before, before I hit over onto our website and where you can get the information about all of those different pathways, I'm also just going to share with you um, this framework. Youth Employment UK created a programme called The Young Professional back in 2014, which aimed to help and respond to the fact that young people don't know what skills they need. Um, it was a programme that identified the core skills that were talked about, those softer employability skills, and young people would come onto our site and can do now and learn about those really important skills they can um, access a little training that's all free to access for 14 to 24 year olds access a little training regardless of their eight status so they can be in school college do this with a youth worker do it independently doesn't matter we don't care um, and really learn about those employability skills and help help them kind of um, learn about more about careers in the world of work we've gone through a really big change to that a young professional 1.0 and we are at the end of this month releasing um, the young professional journey to employment 2.0 and the journey to employment framework was created by NPC and some partners back in 2014 kind of post the the large um, youth unemployment crisis that we've spoken about already and what, the, what the cohort of NPC did in, in this exercise was really identify the factors that a young person needs around them to be working for them in order to progress on into employment. So it's not just employability skills. You can't, you know, it doesn't matter how good your communication or your teamwork skills are. If your own personal circumstances mean that you can't access jobs because there's no transport or you don't have funding to do that, you're not going to be able to move yourself. If you don't know how to write a good CV, again, doesn't matter how, how much money you've got for transport, if, you're, if your CV doesn't hold up, you're not going to be able to compete in the jobs market. So this framework shows us that actually our young people and all of us, it's, it's, it's not an age specific, but certainly in our case, our young people need to have these seven factors around the outside circle uh, working for them, personal circumstances, emotional capabilities, attitudes, skills, qualifications, training, experience and involvement and career management. And when that's all working for them, they may well be able to kind of take those next steps. Still depends on the external factors of the labour market and um, competition for jobs, etc. But it is more holistically looking at the young person rather than, as, as we have previously, focused on employability skills. So what I'm just going to come um, off my presentation to show you is to show you how we have changed our young professionals. 
will teach them and walk through all of those seven areas um, that they can do alongside the support that they get from youth workers, schools, colleges, etc. So what you what young people will do, they, they will have to register. Lots of our site is free to access, loads of careers information, which I'll touch on shortly. Um, but for the journey to work, young people will have to register because it's age and stage specific. So we need to know what age they are, whether they're still in school or whether they're you know, looking for employment or whether they're in employment. And then the content that they will receive will be based on that age and stage information. But regardless, they'll go through the same courses, just with different content. So the first course is you and your needs. And we can see here that there is um, um, course content, including an introduction, quizzes to complete um, and different content to look at. So I'm just going um, to click onto this um, section so you can see the introduction. For every area, we have got a video and I'll just show a little bit of this one. I showed you the whole video, I can't help myself. Um, I'm so proud of my team who are working round the clock to build this um, journey to work framework. So each, each chapter, each, each of those factors has its own section where young people will um, watch that introduction video and then um, based on the journey to employment framework, the NPC will come in and complete different topics. There'll be some reading to do, there'll be some content to look through, there'll be a quiz and different activities. And as anyway, much of this is interactive as possible. Um, but the more they read and the more that they do, um, the more that they complete, they are starting to take real ownership and getting you know, some really good learning here about who they are and how they can build their skills, how they can deal with those factors. We've got a section on transport and what's available and what's support and what they can do about it in all the different ways that, that that JET framework looks at young people to make sure that all young people are getting really good information and support as they move on in that journey to work. There are other additions that are coming to this um, development, and as I say, we are launching this in January, um, but the, the other additions that I can't quite show you are that young people will be able to see how much they are complete on their journey. So you see up here, there's a completion status. So every time they do something, do an activity, spend a bit of time on this, they will see that status bar move. Now, the really cool thing about this is that they will be able to show you a dashboard, you as their work coach, oh, sorry, as their youth worker or their work coach if you were, or if you were in school and you were the careers advisor or the teacher, whoever, whoever you are, your young person would be able to show you that their own dashboard to show, you know, I've completed section one, I've moved on to section two, this is, this is where I am on my journey to work. So that hopefully, you know, you can use the young professionals part of your employability program or your training and support that build evidence based on the JET framework on how your work has moved that young person forward on their journey to work. So we hope that that will become a really useful diagnostic for you to see where they are at the beginning and to see where they are at the end of kind of their training and, and experience on, on programs that you're running with them. 
And this is all free for you to use. Um, young people and youth workers and schools and colleges, we don't, we don't make any charge to, to those who are using our site other than employers. So all of that, that, that dashboard and how you'll use it is all completely free to you. And the other thing that will be here too is young people, when they have their logins and they're doing their young professional journey, they'll also be able to save reflections and create a CV that they'll be able to share externally. And they'll be able to save the different articles um, and things that are really interested that they want to come back to. So it'll be a really interactive learning platform for young people, um, not just about learning about the world of work, but in all those other things about, um, uh, you know, personal circumstances and um, skills and qualifications too. So that's what I want to show you in terms of how we're helping young people, you know, kind of build their skills and their experience and prepare for their next steps. But also on our website, I really wanted to just show you the, the type of career support and information that we've got that will help you help young people navigate the world around them and the options around them. And again, this area is free. You don't need to be logged in or registered to access our, our, our Young People Hub, but I recommend you come to the Youth Employment website, click on Young People and come and have a real good play about the content that's in here, because there's so much. If you're registering and want your young people to register for the Young Professional Journey to Work, that, that's sort of all sitting here. Um, they can register for the current version and then we'll help them move on to the next version. So you can use it as of today, but it doesn't look um, quite, quite how I, I've shown you now because that doesn't go live until the end of um, the month. We can explore careers and there's loads of um, help on finding a job. But also within this section is so much content. Um, it's one of the, one of our biggest achievements. If you've got young people who are looking at comparing A levels or thinking about college and uni, who are worried about student finance, who need some more help, we have got this site up to date on a daily basis with the latest information that's available to you and to, to young people. Um, if it's about finding out which opportunities are available or um, you know like starting a business that young people aren't spoken to about again we've got that advice in here um, when it comes to interview tips um, we get our information about how employers are interviewing directly from employers themselves or those working with young people and employers so this is some really great up-to-date um, advice and guidance around interviews how to use the job center and how to get ready for going to it lots of information there around the services available to young people too, really um, built in a way that young people have told us they want to access this information. We do then, although not a mental health expert, we do have lots of mental health content and we signpost out to other organisations that are, but we start the journey here um, with the young people using our site. We have over 150,000 young people using our site each month and they're coming from all different directions to us. Um, and, and it's because it's so rich and current and built in a way that is, you know, making these things much more exciting. The next area and perhaps the final area, and I will stop, that I wanted to touch on is our careers hub. So if young people that you're working with need some guidance on the different careers that exist, we are a place and resource that you can come to and trust um, you, know, you know, to access up-to-date information. We provide in our careers hub information about all the primary sectors that exist, and you then can go into any of these sectors to learn a little bit more about what that sector is, what it does, what 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 it kind of its its core purpose is. You can find out um, which employers we work with who are youth friendly, who are currently hiring young people against those good youth employment principles. Uh, and you can find out things about labour market information. We link to the Gatsby and the Careers Development Institute frameworks. Um, you can then come into um, any of these career roles and find out um, you know, what qualifications, what pathway, what earning potential there is for specific job roles. So hopefully, as you see, and I'm whizzing through this because I'm just really mindful of your time and, and your energy in attending this session today, um, but we can certainly come back or, or pro provide you with any specific information. But hopefully what you can see from the Youth Employment UK website is that we can, we can walk with you on, on your journey to supporting young people. You don't have to be experts in careers and skills and delivering everything that every young person needs we don't do the face-to-face -face. we don't do that really important thing that young people have said they need time and time again we you know we leave the trusted adulting to the trusted adults but what we want to do is be your 
trusted resource that can make sure that you know the support you're giving is the very best possible support based on um you know what we know from all of our work across the employment space and Alicia, if there are other things in our presentation that you think I've missed. I think it's fair to say that in our in our links, we've got some links to the Youth Voice Census and Youth Friendly Employers, more information about the Ambassador Programme if you've got young people that you think would really benefit from being part of our network in that way. More resources and that we link out to when we're delivering any sort of presentations. I'm happy now to go to a, a sort of bit of a Q&A if there's any time left and see what's happening in the chat box, Alicia. Um, yes, so I just wanted to point out that I have got a couple of links to the URLs that link up to everything that you spoke about already. Um, so if anyone's interested, please go check them out. And we did have a question earlier from Jenny. So she said that Kickstart has not got off the ground um, where she's working at, at the moment. Um, she's put that young people have been waiting for months on the list and with employers wanting to start, what is the hold up? <laughs> yeah, it is a million dollar question. There's a cut there's a there's a couple of things, you know, when when Treasury announced Kickstart, most DWP weren't ready for it, you know, in any way. So they've had to create systems, safeguarding systems, quality systems, purchasing systems, uh, controls and evaluation tools from literally that point that it was announced in the summer so and and dwp is a massive organization with huge training needs there were not enough work coaches on the ground there were not enough employer opportunities so there is a lot in that that is just taking more time than anyone could have anticipated you know essentially dwp colleagues who we deal with these people are working harder than anybody should have to to try and get this right but it is you know there are bottlenecks in the system and then you get that information from the top they've sorted out their systems they've sorted out the processes but it's still got to filter down into a local area i.e that job center wherever you're based and the, the areas you're thinking of and i think about corby that information has got to filter down to corby and you've got to train up those staff they've got to go out and talk to employers employers who you know, I'm the, I'm the most youth friendly business I could think of. I, I can't take on a kick. I couldn't take on a kickstart young person. You know, we're not in the office, so we can't provide that office environment. Most young people would struggle to kind of do this working from home. So it's about creating the volume of opportunity, quality opportunity based on, you know, different needs. So and then, you know, the, the work coaches have to interview, have to prepare and have to present back to employers, the six up to six candidates who are going to be eligible for the job. The employer has to interview you and then and then all of that matching service it's not an overnight fix and um, we probably didn't even really start the system until october november despite it being announced in the summer simply because of those internal control systems not being there so we don't really anticipate kickstart being at volume until april or may this year um which isn't which isn't great because it means there will be young people who've been 12 months unemployed because of covid and that really starts to show scarring impacts on those young people but you know i i, I don't know that i could come up with a quicker system unfortunately probably not the answer you wanted but it's certainly the, what i can see is happening you know in real time with those colleagues we did have another question from simon um he asked if there are any specific programs for young people who might be starting about thinking their own business yeah so the princess trust are still running programs you know they've maintained the funding i know they they too had to furlough staff and this this becomes that issue right that we talked that, that i touched on earlier is that the, the need is greater but actually the delivery and the supply side is is struggling because of furlough and childcare and you know all those all those bigger issues um so princess trust are operating and you know they're a partner of ours and we strongly recommend them but there are other other things there are programs that young enterprise are delivering they're really um, doing some innovative stuff young enterprise um the, in the wake of covid they're putting much more of their content and training for um entrepreneurship online and also um the government have put some free courses available too um so if you look at our starting a business section on the website you kind of find some of those links and opportunities that we know that are happening some of them are very regional and local place-based stuff that we hear about and we post it uh, some of it's more national based so there, there is a mix of different sources of information and support 
Um, I'm just about to start a course next week, which is government funded on um, leadership of, a, of an SME post COVID. So, so there's lots of stuff happening. It's just about being aware of where it is. Um, Jenny, yeah, I've come into the chat box now, Alicia. Jenny, I agree. It's really frustrating that it was advertised. I, I don't think anyone really anticipated. I think everyone was much more hopeful about the timelines than, than the practice allowed it to be. Um, but I agree, it's hugely frustrating, um, and not least because I think you know, people will be out of, you know, in that 12-month cycle, which, which we'd hope to avoid when, when we had that announcement ourselves. But, you know, it's just not possible. Any other question? I mean, it, we're not a massive audience, so if anybody wants to unmute themselves now and and, and chime in, I'd, I'd very much welcome that. And Kevin, if you're still with us, we stay the course too. If there's anything else you think um, you'd like us to expand on or um, that I rushed through too quickly, then please do shout. Oh, doesn't look like there's any further questions, LJ. <laughs> um, Right, okay. Um, well, thank you, LJ, and thank you, Alicia, for that. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, really useful, really informative. I think it's probably my favourite one to date, and people who know me will know that I often say that sort of thing, but it's the first time I've said it with these. So it's, <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> Before I, I, believe, say, I believe you, Kevin, I believe you. I've got an honest face. Um, so before everyone goes, I'd just like... Uh, very, very quickly, we do have an evaluation form which we'd love you to fill in. We do read them, we do learn from them, and more importantly, they do help inform the lottery that we haven't just run off to the Bahamas with their money. Um, so Steve will post in the chat the link to the evaluation form. Um, if you could click on that and open it before you leave the meeting, then it'll be open on your desk and you can fill it in at your leisure. Um, but we would really appreciate that if you could. Um, so finally, yeah, that's that's it from me. And just once again, want to thank LJ and Alicia. That was a really, really useful and good um, presentation. Um, so thank you for taking the time to do that. That's great. Um, everybody else, the next one of these is on Friday, uh, where we're going to be taking a look at youth violence. Um, so come along for that. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Don't forget to do the evaluation. It's in the chat right now. Thanks very much. Bye bye.